2015, in the dead of the night, a team of Mexican Marines, led by a man known as El Marino Loco, launched a daring raid on the home of a notorious drug lord named El Mimito. Their mission was clear, capture the feared criminal. After they successfully caught El Mimito, El Marino Loco decided to take matters into his own hands. In a shocking display, he forced El Mimito to wear a woman's dress and kiss one of his hitmen, all to entertain his squad. This bold and humiliating act, along with many others like it, made El Marino Loco one of the most hated and feared men among drug lords across Mexico. But before diving into the full story, we must first ask the question, who exactly is El Marino Loco? Eric Morales Guevara, also known as El Marino Loco, is a mysterious figure who served as an infantryman in the Mexican Navy. Standing at five feet seven inches tall, with a dark complexion and an athletic build, he was a man who kept his identity hidden. His face was always covered, whether by a sweatshirt, mask, or sunglasses, making sure no one could recognize him. But this wasn't just for show. He had good reasons to remain in the shadows. Guevara's journey to becoming a Mexican Marine was full of challenges. In 2007, he was selected to be part of a new special team within the Navy, set up to fight drug trafficking and organized crime. To join this unit, Guevara had to undergo tough training, handle demanding missions, and face constant risks and unpredictability. Despite these difficulties, he stayed focused on his goal of achieving justice and freedom. His strong commitment inspired both his fellow soldiers and the public. Powerful drug lords were constantly on his trail, but El Marino Loco was never afraid. He and the group of Marines under his command were dedicated to taking down every drug lord operating in the states of Tamaulipas and Nuevo Leon. El Marino Loco earned his reputation not only for capturing these notorious criminals, but also for the humiliating ways in which he made them pay for their crimes. He would force them to dress in women's clothing, and sometimes even make them perform degrading acts. Before judging these actions, it's important to understand the ruthlessness of the drug lords he targeted. The Gulf Cartel is a major crime group and drug smuggling organization based in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, Mexico, right across the U.S. border from Brownsville, Texas. It's one of Mexico's oldest crime groups. The cartel has a global network with connections to criminal groups. The Gulf Cartel also has connections with the Indrangheta, an Italian crime group. They have used secure BlackBerry phones to communicate with their European partners. The cartel is expanding into Europe, where there is a strong market for drugs, especially in Eastern Europe and Western Europe. In Africa, they are taking advantage of the chaos and poverty in West Africa to set up routes for their drug trade, aiming to supply the profitable European market. Founded in the 1930s by Juan Nepomuceno Guerra, the cartel initially focused on smuggling alcohol into the U.S. during Prohibition and later heroin. However, in the 1980s, under Guerra and Juan Garcia Abrigo, the cartel shifted to trafficking cocaine, methamphetamine, and marijuana. The group, once called the Matamoros Cartel, became notorious for its criminal activities which grew significantly in the 1970s. The cartel carried out their operations in different ways, and one of those ways is protection racketeering. Criminal groups use protection racketeering to control markets and keep order within their ranks. Essentially, they create their version of insurance by pretending to offer security. This method involves demanding money from people in exchange for not harming them. In Mexico, this practice extends to the human trafficking industry. Cartels force smugglers to pay fees for using their routes, and if they refuse, the traffickers often respond with violence. The Gulf Cartel uses a similar approach, extorting businesses for protection money in their areas of control and threatening to kill those who don't comply. Additionally, Mexican drug cartels also impose taxes on businesses in the U.S threatening them with property damage and murder if they don't pay. The cartel is involved in kidnapping. The Gulf Cartel and their rivals, Los Zetas, are responsible for the majority of kidnappings in Mexico. 
Over half of the country's kidnappings are linked to these two groups. The Gulf Cartel operates numerous kidnapping rings throughout Tamaulipas. In Tamaulipas and Nuevo León, where the Gulf Cartel and Los Zetas fight over territory, abductions are very common. An intelligence agency revealed that the Gulf Cartel kidnaps people for three main reasons. To replace cartel members who have been killed or arrested, to eliminate members of rival gangs, and to demand ransom money and other valuables. In April 2011, in Reynosa, Tamaulipas, a border city, 68 people from different regions of Mexico and Central America were discovered in a Gulf Cartel safe house. Omar Ortiz, known as El Gato, and a former soccer star with CF Monterrey, was arrested on January 2012 for his involvement in a kidnapping ring within the Gulf Cartel. Similarly, Lucha Libre wrestler Lazaro Gurola, known as the Estrella Dorada, Golden Star, was also caught kidnapping people for the cartel. In the United States, the Gulf Cartel has been linked to several kidnappings, mostly in the McAllen metropolitan area. Authorities believe there are even more unreported kidnappings in nearby areas. When these cartels operate in the U.S., they often hide victims in car trunks and transport them to Mexico. The FBI has reported that victims are kidnapped, threatened, beaten, drugged, and moved into Mexico to meet cartel members. Additionally, Gulf cartel kidnappers are said to train with paintball gear to practice their kidnapping techniques. In one case, Isaac Sanchez Gutierrez from Palmview, Texas, was given a choice, pay $10 million to the cartel or transport 50 drug shipments from Mexico into the U.S. to save his kidnapped brother. The cartel also engaged in human trafficking. Before 2010, it wasn't clear if the Gulf Cartel was in charge of human trafficking in its area or if it just took a cut from those using its smuggling routes. La Jornada noted that before splitting from Los Zetas in 2007, the Reynosa area in Tamaulipas was frequently used for smuggling people. Now, a group within the Gulf Cartel called Los Flacos manages the human trafficking operations moving undocumented migrants from South America to the United States. They mainly work along the route through Tabasco, Veracruz, and Tamaulipas. By December 2011, human trafficking in the Rio Grande Valley was labeled Ground Zero and even referred to as the New Arizona by Homeland Security Today. A U.S. agent explained that the drug cartels operating along the Mexico-United States border especially across from Texas, control not just drug trafficking but also human smuggling. The Gulf Cartel was also not left out when it came to extortion. In August 2007, the La Mania Gang, which is thought to be a part of the larger criminal groups Los Zetas and the Gulf Cartel, was said to be in charge of the extortion racket in Matamoros, Tamaulipas. According to La Vanguardia, the Gulf Cartel makes a lot of money by threatening and demanding payments from businesses throughout Tamaulipas. Many of these threats start over the phone. Critics argue that when authorities arrest drug lords, it often leads to more extortion. This is because the cartels are then forced to find new ways to make money. Bribery was another tactic the cartel used to operate. In the 1970s, when the Gulf Cartel was moving huge amounts of cocaine into the United States and carrying millions of dollars in cash across the border, Juan Garcia Abrego felt he needed extra protection. Court records show that Garcia Abrego was bribing law enforcement officials, prosecutors, and politicians on both sides of the border to keep himself safe from prosecution. According to his former associates, he was paying one of Carlos Salinas de Gortari's top deputy attorneys general more than $1.5 million each month for protection. Garcia Abrego is also said to have had a large private army of armed guards. A retired FBI agent who is an expert on drug trafficking noted that the Gulf Cartel relied heavily on bribery to grow its drug empire and gain influence. FBI agents have reported that the cartel moves millions of dollars in cash through the Rio Grande Valley every month, which is very tempting for many U.S. officials. Much of this money remains in the area, leading some federal and state officials to give in to the lure of easy money. The Gulf Cartel also bribes journalists to keep violent incidents out of the news. 
Additionally, because many police officers in Mexico are poorly paid, the cartel frequently buys them to protect their operations. The Gulf Cartel has funded its operations through various illegal activities, one of which involves stealing oil from Pemex. In 2011, it was reported that the cartel stole about 40% of the oil products in northern Mexico. They then sold this stolen oil, both within Mexico and on the American black market. After his arrest, a leader of the Gulf Cartel admitted that while drug trafficking is their primary business, oil theft has provided a crucial financial boost due to the challenges they've faced. Additionally, the cartel has been known to steal vehicles as part of their criminal activities. The Gulf Cartel often hides its money by moving it through various bank accounts, properties, cars, and gas stations. Bars and casinos are commonly used by these drug cartels to clean their money. High-ranking members of the Gulf Cartel, such as Juan Garcia Abrego, Osiel Cardenas Guillén, Jorge Eduardo Costilla Sanchez, and Antonio Cardenas Guillén, have been accused by the U.S. government of laundering millions of dollars. Even bank accounts in the United States are used to wash money for these Gulf Cartel leaders. According to The Economist in 1997, the Gulf Cartel's drug money in the Rio Grande Valley was estimated to be around $20 billion, with about 15% of retail profits in the area coming from this drug money. The Gulf Cartel mostly operates its arms trafficking directly across the U.S. border, just like many other criminal groups in Mexico. However, some parts of the Gulf Cartel handle arms trafficking within Mexico itself. Although arms are often smuggled from the U.S. to Mexico by individuals rather than organized groups, there isn't a dedicated criminal organization for this purpose in Mexico or internationally. On July 3, 2011, Jesus Enrique Rejón Aguilar, a top leader of the Los Zetas, was captured and revealed in a national television interview that the Gulf Cartel, unlike Los Zetas, has easier and quicker access to arms in the U.S. He suggested that the Gulf Cartel might even work with some government officials to smuggle weapons into Mexico. The Gulf Cartel is believed to use prostitution networks to influence journalists to write favorably about them. Prostitutes are also used as spies and informants, offering their services to extract information from targets. Mexican criminal groups like the Gulf Cartel use counterfeiting to launder money. This method is tax-free and makes fake products available to people who can't afford originals. They counterfeit items like clothing, TVs, video games, music, software, and movies. For instance, in 2008, the Gulf Cartel was reported to control a large counterfeit operation in Michoacan, where they produced and sold millions of fake CDs and movies. Gunmen from the Gulf Cartel often dress up as police officers, using military uniforms to confuse rival gangs and move freely through the streets. The Gulf Cartel controls a large area in northern Tamaulipas, especially around the border cities of Reynosa and Matamoros. This control has allowed them to set up a complex and far-reaching network for drug trafficking and distribution along the U.S.-Mexico border in South Texas. In this area, Mexican drug cartels are using gang members to handle drug distribution and other illegal activities. These gangs, which include street gangs and prison gangs, are the Texas Syndicate, the Latin Kings, the Mexican Mafia, Puro Tango Blast, Valucos, the Hermandad de Pistoleros Latinos, and the Tri-City Bombers, all operating in the Rio Grande Valley and Webb County, Texas. Drug trafficking and illegal smuggling have been major issues along the Mexico-United States border for decades. But some areas in Texas see more of this activity than others. Notable hotspots are the Rio Grande Valley and West Texas, especially near the El Paso Juarez metropolitan area. The busy movement of people and goods across the border helps the drug trade. Most of the trade between the U.S. and Mexico passes through Texas. Because of its complex transportation networks and proximity to major drug production areas in Mexico, Texas is a key location for drug trafficking. Drug traffickers often use private cars and commercial trucks to move drugs throughout Texas. 
they typically use major highways like interstates as well as U.S. highways. Additionally, the Gulf of Mexico poses a risk, with the Port of Houston and the Port of Brownsville serving as entry points for traffickers using small boats and pleasure crafts to move drugs into and out of southern Texas. Drugs also make their way into Texas through various means, including commercial airplanes, cars, buses, passenger trains, and even package delivery services. Railroads connecting the U.S. and Mexico are another route for smuggling. Drug traffickers sometimes use small boats to move drugs along the coast of South Texas, often under the cover of night to avoid detection. They also build tunnels to bypass border security, allowing them to move drugs without being caught. Once across the border, common cars and trucks are used to quickly distribute the drugs to different cities. Additionally, drug cartels have even started using narco submarines to transport drugs via the sea. In 2006, a man known as El Marino Loco became suddenly famous on YouTube thanks to a series of videos that quickly gained millions of views. These weren't your regular clips. They showed El Marino Loco and his team catching and embarrassing drug lords, putting their enemies in situations no one would want to be in. This wave of attention came just after El Marino Loco was sent to work in the border city of Reynosa. His mission was a big one. He was ordered to catch Julian Luisa Salinas, also known as El Comandante Toro, who was believed to be the regional leader of the Gulf Cartel. El Marino Loco got incredibly close to catching El Comandante Toro. But then, out of nowhere, he was suddenly moved to another city, Tamaulipas. This move made him the Gulf Cartel's number one enemy, and it also left him very angry. After all, Julian Luisa Salinas was one of his most dangerous rivals. Though fate eventually brought El Comandante Toro back into El Marino Loco's grasp, as you'll soon discover, the next drug lords who crossed paths with him would soon wish they'd never been born. What El Marino Loco put them through was worse than their worst nightmares. El Marino's job was to raid the house of the former mayor of Altamira, Avenel Hernandez Llano. Reports said that Llano had been working with the famous Gulf Cartel. But when El Marino and his team got to Llano's house, they found Llano and his son waiting for them. Instead of fighting, Llano and his son directed them to the home of a much bigger target, the Gulf Cartel leader in the area, Silvestre Rodriguez, known as El Chive. El Marino couldn't resist the urge to go after such a well-known criminal. So, he and his team changed direction and went to El Chive's house, hoping to catch the slippery cartel leader. But when they got there, El Chive was nowhere to be found. This was a disappointing setback for El Marino, who was not the kind of man to leave a job without making his presence known. So, he decided to take matters into his own hands, determined to leave a lasting mark even if he couldn't catch his target. Loco stormed into El Chiva's house with an anger that couldn't be controlled. He didn't just take what he wanted, he wrecked the place, breaking anything valuable. In a cruel move, he even stole the ashes of El Chiva's dead father and damaged a special photo of the man. Loco could have left without doing any of this, but he chose to add more harm. As he left El Chiva's home, Loco ran into three tough guys. They thought they could take him on, but Loco quickly showed them otherwise. He beat them badly, determined to find out where El Chiva was hiding. And clearly, Loco knew exactly how to get people talking because soon after, El Chiva was found and caught in a hospital in Tampico. His brother, Marco Antonio Otto Rodriguez, was also caught just a few days later. But Loco wasn't done. During the same operation, he shamed another drug lord, El Mamido, who was with the Gulf Cartel. At this point, it was clear that Loco didn't care how powerful or dangerous these drug lords were. He feared no one. He made sure these criminals suffered before he handed them over to the Mexican police to face justice. El Mamido, a well-known figure, was made to wear a woman's dress, put on lip gloss, and kiss his own hitman. Loco and his team filmed this strange act and mocked him. When the video was shared on social media, it caused anger everywhere. 
among leaders of the Gulf Cartel, the general public, and even the Mexican Marines. Navy officials criticized Loco's methods as unusual and unprofessional, even though El Marino Loco and their team had been very successful in catching drug lords. The Gulf Cartel, unable to catch El Marino, tried to bribe him with lavish gifts, fine alcohol, and beautiful women. But El Marino turned them down. He said he couldn't be bought and promised to capture every drug lord he could find. But the big question remains, why did El Marino have to humiliate these criminals instead of just capturing them and bringing them into custody? El Marino Loco didn't clearly explain why he embarrassed his enemies, but his actions were clear. In his world, decisions are made with tough thinking, and among his group of thugs, someone has to be in charge. That leader must always be strong and commanding. So, El Marino Loco's way of putting them down was to dress them like women, make them do embarrassing things, and force them to interact with others in degrading ways. He believed that by doing this, he was showing them what he thought of them and demonstrating his power. In Mexico, drug lords are seen as symbols of extreme strength, so to weaken them is not just an insult, it's like stripping them of their authority and status. This action turned the conflict between El Marino Loco and the Gulf Cartel into a full-blown war. But if there's one thing we've learned about El Marino, it's that he never backs down from a fight. The high point of his time in the Mexican Navy was when he faced off against his longtime rival, Manuel Luisa Salinas, who was also known as Comandante Toro. As mentioned earlier, Comandante Toro was the leader of the Gulf Cartel. Toro's group kidnapped a Mexican Marine and demanded a ransom of 1.5 million pesos from the Marine's family. The family could only raise 800,000 pesos, so the Gulf Cartel decided to kill the Marine. Little did they realize that this would be their biggest mistake. The Mexican government was determined to respond to this brutal act, and there was no better person for the job than El Marino Loco himself. Loco had been pursuing Toro for a long time, and this was his chance to finally bring the drug lord to justice. On April 2015, the showdown was about to begin. El Marino Loco and his team set up 32 roadblocks along Highway 32, with about 11 of these blockades made using burning vehicles. These roadblocks were meant to prevent Comandante Toro from escaping the city. During the last gunfight between the Mexican Marines and Comandante Toro, Toro was finally shot and killed. But that wasn't the end of the story. After the fight, El Marino returned to the home of the Marine who had been kidnapped. There, he accidentally stepped on a small object lying on the ground. Curious, he asked the kidnapped Marine's wife what it was, and she told him it was a meat tenderizer. El Marino asked if he could take it with him. When she inquired why, he replied in a rough voice that he wanted to use it to hit the thugs. That's how El Marino ended up with the notorious meat tenderizer, which he used to beat up criminals. This event also earned him the nicknames Thor and Lord of the Hammer. However, it marked the beginning of the decline of his glorious days. The fall of El Marino Loco became a hot topic on social media. He had several songs written about him, but people's reactions to his methods were mixed. The Gulf Cartel tried to take him down legally, accusing him of using stolen weapons, taking bribes, and even stealing the ashes of El Chibe's father. Only the last accusation turned out to be true. Unable to defend himself, El Marino Loco was officially kicked out of the Mexican Navy. However, El Marino Loco wasn't one to give up easily. Some say he's working with authorities in Sonora to tackle crime near the border, while others claim he's still active in Michoacan. There, he allegedly continues his disturbing habit of capturing victims and dressing them in women's lingerie. This is believable because there have been reports from Mexican authorities about criminals in Michoacan being found in female lingerie. The Gulf Cartel thought they had seen the last of El Marino Loco after his dismissal, but they were mistaken. He wasn't ready to give up just yet. El Marino Loco's surprising comeback might seem heroic, but his actions were illegal. The shocking part is that his methods influenced other Mexican officials. Between 2013 and 2014, 
about 2,400 suspected criminals were brutally attacked and tortured. Some of the torture methods included putting plastic bags over victims' heads to force them to give up information. One particularly disturbing case involved a video that was leaked to the U.S. site Breitbart, Texas. The video showed a federal police agent and a military police officer torturing a woman with a bag over her head. They did this without even knowing if she was a criminal. This video sparked even more criticism of El Marino Loco's extreme methods, even after he was dismissed from the Navy. In response to the public outcry, El Marino Loco agreed to an interview in 2021. He stated, I'm now in Sonora with my team. None of us are criminals or have criminal records. We are ex-military, trained, and ready for anything. We don't harm anyone who doesn't deserve it. We come from the South, where we've already settled disputes. Now we are focusing on the North and the Center. Mexican officials haven't shared much about El Marino Loco's current activities, but there are hints about where he might be. Witnesses say Eric Morales, who goes by El Marino Loco, has started his secret anti-drug group. This group works quietly and stays hidden from the public eye. However, details about Eric Morales Guevara, also known as El Marino Loco, and his actions need careful thought. Stories about him might differ, and since drug cartels operate in secret and often clash with each other, finding the full truth is tough. The rise of figures like El Marino Loco highlights the dangerous and complicated world of drug dealing in Mexico. Law enforcement might use unusual methods to fight back. But if people act violently like El Marino Loco, it could lead to more cycles of violence among the cartels. Building a safer society can be difficult because of this. To tackle cartel violence effectively, we need a complete strategy that includes law enforcement, community development, and international cooperation. Fighting drug trafficking requires governments to focus on its root causes, such as poverty, lack of education, and corruption. Reducing the power of cartels can be achieved through social programs, transparent governance, and economic opportunities. The fight against cartels is a global issue, needing countries to work together. Sharing intelligence, coordinating efforts, and using unified strategies can make law enforcement more effective. International organizations should continue to support countries affected by organized crime with resources, expertise, and capacity building programs. Strengthening the justice system and ensuring accountability for crimes, including those involving cartels, is also crucial. This helps create a safer and fairer community for everyone. To prevent future violence and seek justice for victims, investigations must be impartial, trials fair, and sentences appropriate. It's also important to protect and support those who cooperate with law enforcement and victims of cartel violence. In northern Mexico, the Gulf Cartel lost significant power, and El Marino Loco is seen as a symbol of hope due to his dedication and quest for justice. His story shows the courage and determination needed to face cartel violence. Despite the extreme dangers, he stood up to the cartels while maintaining justice and righteousness. Eric Morales Guevara's story, known as El Marino Loco, reveals the complex and hidden world of cartel violence in Mexico. Addressing this violence requires a careful and comprehensive approach. By supporting victims and witnesses and tackling the root causes of crime through international collaboration, we can work towards a safer environment and dismantle the cartels. Are his methods justified or did he cross the line? Share your opinion with us in the comments section.